Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So our 11 o'clock press conference is explaining extreme events of 2018 from a climate perspective. And our panelists today are Chris Funk from USGS and UC Santa Barbara, Stephanie Herring from NOAA, Walt Meyer from the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and Jeff Rosenfeld from the American Meteorological Society. Well, welcome to San Francisco. Um, this is a really special year for AGU, of course, uh, as a centennial year, and uh, also a special year for uh, the American Meteorological Society. Um, it's also our 100th year. Uh, my name, again, is Jeff Rosenfeld. I'm with the AMS as the Editor-in-Chief of the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And uh, here with Stephanie uh, Herring, who is the person who really drives this whole project, I would say, along with a couple other key players here in the room. Uh, Chris Funk from uh, UC Santa Barbara and Walt Meyer from uh, the NOAA's uh, National Ice and uh, Snow, Snow and Ice Data Center. Okay, I hope I get in the right order. But it, um, we're going to tell you a little bit about uh, extremes. Um, but first, I want to just uh, go back a little bit to this uh, San Francisco theme, which I think is really interesting. Um, we're here to celebrate the past and inspire the future. And I think um, if you think about it, a uh, hundred years ago, things were quite different, of course. Um, we wouldn't have had really any good coordinated balloon launches to get upper air uh, uh, patterns at all. We wouldn't even know what was going on up there most of the time. Very few upper air observations. Uh, in fact, th speaking of the upper air, we didn't even know that the stratosphere existed. The word had not even been invented yet. It had not in been observed in any way. Um, if you think about it, climate. Uh, climate. I don't know if that, oh, oh wow, sorry. Climate, um, that was almost as much about eugenics as it was about uh, the science of the atmosphere. So uh, 100 years ago, <laughs> things have made uh, a big difference. Uh, in 100 years now, we're talking about all of the things that uh, matter about the atmosphere and how it's changing, the upper air, the stratosphere, all of these things that weren't even known, basically, um, 100 years ago. They're an essential part of this report. Um, Anyway, uh, thinking also about past and future, that is kind of what this report is. Um, this is our eighth annual uh, Explaining Extreme Events, uh, in this case of 2018, from a climate perspective. And um, I would say eight years have changed a lot. Um, it feels like a century in terms of how the science has changed. And I think when you look at this report, you'll see how the papers have evolved and uh, how much more adventurous and ambitious they are now. I think that's a, a real key point here. Uh, we're looking into really the future of science, not just what we've done in the past. Um, now extremes, why are we studying extremes? Well, they are the way that we experience climate. Uh, they're the disasters, the catastrophes, the record-breaking events. Um, and uh, in a way, uh, being able to talk about extremes in the context of climate change is really what this report is all about. This is what we've established with the report. We've also been trying to establish not just a way to communicate about extremes, but I think most importantly to, to establish a baseline of what we can do, what uh, these incredible authors can do, really, uh, in terms of studying uh, the human uh, fingerprint in the extremes that we actually experience. And so by establishing the baseline of what the techniques are, what the methods are, and what the possibilities are, uh, this report has really paved um, the way for alerting the public in new ways and in useful ways. Um, now, uh, attributions um, are basically, uh, in that way, an interesting fit for the AGU uh, theme because they're a way of tying the past to the future. Uh, attributions model the past as it is, uh, as, as, as it has been experienced, but they also model the fantasy past, so to speak, or what we often will term planet B. Uh, by comparing planet B with the planet we have had, uh, we have a way of determining uh, this human influence on what's going on now. And we can see that um, basically the present is what um, we're experiencing now. Is It's a volatile juncture between that past that is setting a stage for the future. And so um, uh, I, I'd like to point out then, uh, at that juncture right now in 2018 where we're seeing our papers that um, until now, it might not have been possible, uh, even just eight years ago in, in this issue. Uh, the, the, the progress is so rapid that um, 
I think you're going to see that these papers are, are, are no longer just focusing on what's easiest to fit with the narrative of climate is warming. I mean, what we would see much more of in the past was a paper, say, about uh, temperature extremes, because that's easy to, to study in, in a way. Uh, what we're looking at now are papers that embrace an incredible range of phenomena. We're talking about floods, we're talking about droughts, we're talking about sea ice, we're talking about hailstorms in this issue. We're, we have a, an incredible range of phenomena. And that is uh, really a testament to the amount of work that's been going into developing this field so rapidly. Um, one way to look at that is, is that uh, these papers are able to get down to a nuance in terms of how they define events in terms of the kinds of feedbacks they're willing to look at, and in terms of the connections between continents, between various things from how the tropics relate to sea ice, how uh, China and India are linked by certain processes. And these things drive how these extremes turn out and how humans are influencing uh, the extremes that we're actually seeing. So um, uh, I think. Uh, that, too, is a, another way of looking at how climate and weather are a little bit different. Uh, you know, when we talk about climate, we're often talking about averages. We're now trying to change that conversation with these issues to talk about extremes, because that's weather, which is what we're really experiencing. And, and weather, in a way, then represents kind of a narrowing of focus, but uh, from the big general to the very specific. And, therefore the very useful information that we need to be drawing out of climate change information. But at the same time that these papers are doing this kind of narrowing, uh, they're doing an expanding because they're expanding into not just how the weather works, but how the weather works in conjunction with the ecology and the, um, uh, all of the different surface conditions that are um, a part, an important part of the climate system. So uh, there's a, at the same time that we're focusing so that people can understand what climate change is doing to us here and now, we're seeing this rapid progress that enables a great expansion and uh, complexity to these papers. And again, this year I think really marks that. You will see that quite a bit in these presentations today. So um, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, Stephanie Herring, who, as I said, is the lead editor of this uh, series, and she will explain in better detail. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. <coughs> um, is that work? Am I hitting the wrong button? Oh, you want to try this one? <laughs> Here, this one. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, yeah, my name is Stephanie Herring. I am one of the co editors for the BAMS Explaining Extreme right. Events in a Climate Perspective Report. I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall content of the report, and again, if this AGU theme this year of the past and the future, try and pull some, um, pull some thoughts together on that. So report highlights. Uh, event types included in this year's report, again, the, the heat and cold extremes, but also drought, fire, uh, Arctic sea ice extent, which Walt will be talking about, as well as um, precipitation. Of the 19 events studied, 18 found a role for climate change. Uh, the one event that did not, uh, and I'll get <clears throat> a little bit more into the reasons for this, but just because a paper does not find a role for climate change doesn't mean that that role isn't necessarily there. It means that the researchers didn't have the tools in their toolbox to necessarily find that signal. So there's really two reasons why we might not find a signal. For the case of the one paper this year that did not find a signal, which was for an extreme precipitation event in Tasmania, they do explicitly state that part of the problem, or the challenge they were facing was that because of the extremeness of the event, that the observational record was not sufficiently robust for them to be able to capture what the true um, risk of profile that might, that might look like and therefore had challenges in determining whether climate change played a role. Um, an event uh, closer to home was the mid-Atlantic flooding that occurred over the course of the summer. There were ma many, many uh, um, photos like this. This one particular one is from Ellicott City in Maryland in May 2018. And a group looking at this whole mid-Atlantic precip over the course of the summer found that it was 1.5 times more likely due to human-caused climate change. Um, 
Um, I also want to take a look back in this, again, this theme of looking um, to the past. Uh, I will always caveat that the BAMS Explaining Extremes report do not represent a random sampling of extreme events that have happened over the Earth over the course of the year. There is selection bias. Um, authors do pick the events that they're interested in, and very often they tend to choose events that have happened in um, close proximity to that author group. And so the majority of papers do come from North America, Europe, Asia, Australia. We are undersampling the continents of South America and Africa. And undersampling of the oceans. Um, with that caveat in place, after eight years, we now do have 168 papers in BAMS explaining extreme events alone. This is not including papers in the broader literature. Of course, people do publish attribution results outside of this report. <coughs> um, of those, uh, 122, so right around 73%, have found a role for climate change over the past eight years, and 46, or about 27%, uh, have not found a role for climate change, so about a 70-30 split. What's been interesting, though, is that over the past two years, um, this statistical average is not evenly distributed across the past eight years. Um, the past two years, 95% of the events studied uh, actually found a role for human-caused climate change. And as I mentioned, one of those two papers um, explicitly references the lack of strength and observational record as one of the reasons. So if, um, looking back at over eight years, we actually had 29 different event types that have been studied over the past eight years. You can see it's a pretty diverse list, everything from what you would normally expect, hot, cold, uh, extreme precipitation, to things like sunshine, um, either extreme sunshine or extreme lack of sunshine. So people have really tried to apply these techniques to all kinds of different extreme events, which is, I think, very interesting. Um, as you'll see, though, over here um, in the table, sorry, not punching the right button. Um, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> in the table, the majority of the um, 168 events really are driven by temperature extremes, either hot or cold, and precipitation extremes, either uh, excessive precipitation is counted in this um, row here, drought, of course, being a combination of both of a lack of precipitation and oftentimes high temperatures. Um, dry, con dry conditions also refer to a, uh, a lack of precipitation, but it may not have resulted in a drought. Um, ocean temperature and uh, sea ice in the Arctic are also two event types that have been quite common. So what do we actually see when we look at these over the um, events that are percent of found versus not found? Um, the first year, 2011, is sort of a small sample. We only had, this is our first year. We actually only had six papers. So, <clears throat> but the rest of these bullets here represent anywhere from 20 to 35 papers per year. Uh, and as you can see, we've steadily seen an increase in the percentage of papers that find a signal versus the percentage that's not found. So about 70-30 split is an aggregate over eight years and not necessarily um, what we're seeing now. So um, the other, uh, one of the other, in addition to that overall trend, of course, in 2016, we saw that th these events began to emerge where it was determined that human, um, <clears throat> the event was not possible without human-caused climate change. And what does that mean? So as Jeff mentioned, one of the um, ways in which we look at this uh, is that taking big events like the global heat record, um, record heat over Asia and warm waters in the Bering Sea. As I mentioned, these emerged in 2016, and since then we've seen other reports of, um, <clears throat> of events like this elsewhere in the literature. So what um, allows them to, to make a statement like that? And really when we get into attribution, there's what we like to call the three pillars of sound attribution, and I like to attribute this to this graphic to John Nielsen Gammon. Uh, but it was, the data in here is drawn from a National Academy of Sciences report so there's really three elements. One is the quality of the observational record. Uh, another one is the ability of our models to actually simulate and replicate these events. And finally, um, whether or not the mechanisms of how climate change is expected to impact um, an extreme event type is known. So for <clears throat> the last one, I realize it probably might be the most confusing, for example, for temperature, um, we have a very good understanding from basic thermodynamics of what uh, increased CO2 emissions and increased greenhouse gas emissions will do to things like temperature extremes. Our understanding of how something like that might impact severe convective storms, for example, becomes um, much weaker. And so this is really when we have a robust observational record, when the models are of high quality and we understand the physical processes, that's when we're able to make attribution statements of of good, of good strength. And what role do model simulations play in this? Um, so we actually, um, in the climate change realm, we actually take the statistical approach from the public health community. So in epidemiology, uh, if you wanna know what the risk of smoking would do to your, uh, sorry, uh, what smoking would do to your risk of getting lung cancer, what they'll do is they will take a cohort of people who smoke and a cohort of people that don't smoke, look at the risk in these relative two populations and assess the impact of smoking on your risk of lung cancer. 
in climate change science, we actually use the same statistical approach. We take the risk of an event occurring in a world with climate change, and then we need a planet B. We need a cohort that hasn't been influenced by climate change, and since that doesn't exist, we have a planet B that we model. And then we can look at the change in risk between these two and come up with what we refer to as a fraction of attributable risk. And um, Walt will get into this a little bit more as well with his paper. And so this allows us to um, understand what variables uh, have, have impacted the, the change in risk. And so when we look at the, um, the graph that I showed earlier, where we're starting to see more and more higher percentage of papers find a role for climate change, um, one of the explanations could be that we simply have strengthened the toolbox that scientists have access to. We have improved the quality of the observational records, we're improving the quality of the models, and through research we're improving our physical process understanding. And this allows us to better detect the signal from the noise. Of course, um, the, this is another, uh, just a graphical representation of when we're actually able to make um, high quality or co have high confidence in the capabilities of our attribution of specific events with temperature uh, being up here um, and things like severe convective storms, as I mentioned, being in the bottom left quadrant. The other, um, of course, driver and potential reason where we're seeing some of these increase in uh, papers that are finding a climate change signal could be that the actual role of climate change is becoming more pronounced in extreme events. And as I mentioned, in 2016, we started to see the emergence of these events that were not, quote, not possible without climate change. And so going forward, trying to understand how much of what we're seeing is the strengthening of the climate change signal and how much of this is resulting from our improved ability to have a stronger toolbox for the scientists to be able to understand, um, distinguish between the signal and the noise is going to be uh, an important area. And I think that the BAMS Explaining Extremes report has been very helpful in sort of aggregating a lot of these methodologies and a lot of these science so that we can start looking at the past to understand what we, ex what we might ex be expecting for the future. Um, and then I think Walt, there we go. So I will turn it over to Chris. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Chris Funk with the US Geological Survey. And I'm going to talk today about the 2018 Four Corners drought and the potential for climate change to have impacted that drought. I'm going to find that while climate change didn't cause that drought, it did increase the impacts uh, of that drought and affected a lot of vulnerable populations. Um, but first, I'm going to have a few slides that kind of set the context and help us understand uh, how that extreme event played out in a, in a, a kind of global context. So um, kind of following up on uh, Stephanie's point about how things would be getting really warm quickly, uh, I've shown here uh, the a fraction of the Earth's surface that is uh, exceptionally warm where exceptionally warm is in the top 1% of the distribution of temperatures between 1900 to 1979. So if you want to imagine what that would be like, imagine you have a dozen eggs, and in that 1900 to 79 world, you'd expect an egg to be exceptionally hot maybe once every 10 years, okay? So if we look uh, in 2019, we can see that about 17% of the Earth's surface in this year, up through October, was exceptionally warm, which would mean that two out of those dozen eggs is warmer in the top 1% of the pre-1979 distribution. So things have really uh, ramped up quickly in terms of how warm they're getting. And we can also look at uh, the change in temperatures over land, in term if we take the warmest temperature every year at all the grid points on the land and then average it, we can see that that's gone up according to the GHCN uh, empirical observation uh, about two degrees since the early 1990s. So we're seeing a lot of warming and this could be related to uh, this increase in attribution that Stephanie is saying we're seeing in the reports. In our specific study, we're asking what this increase in temperature meant for the Four Corners region. Uh, another important context for these studies is that if we look at either global or national catastrophe databases, uh, we see a really marked increase in the number of uh, weather-related catastrophes. 
This is a, the Munich Ray database um, where I've just pulled the number of natural catastrophes a year, and there were about 400 in the 1990s, and now we're looking at about 700 uh, if we look over the last several years, so almost a two-fold increase. If we uh, look at the United States using the NOAA Billion Dollar Disaster Database, we can see that the number of billion dollar disasters in the 1990s uh, was about five a year. And in the last uh, three to four years, we're seeing about 13 a year. And the total cost of these disasters between 2015 and, two sorry, 2016 and 2018 was more than $450 billion a year. So that's a huge number that's similar to the amount that we were spending when we had the Iraq War. So, not all of that is climate change, of course, right? This is related to also expanding human population and economies, but there's no doubt that climate and weather extremes are having a huge economic cost. So if we want to understand how these warming temperatures are impacting places like the you know, arid southwestern United States, we need to understand this really straightforward physical relationship between increasing air temperatures and increasing atmospheric water demand or saturation vapor pressure. And sorry, this got messed up a little bit, but basically on the left-hand side we have a cold atmosphere, okay? And in cold atmosphere, the nitrogen and oxygen molecules are close by each other. And so that limits the, the atmosphere's ability to draw water vapor out of the surface of the air. And then if you warm that atmosphere by a degree or two, there's 100% certainty that the saturation vapor pressure of that air is going to go up a lot. So you can draw more water vapor from the land surface. And in our study, we basically asked a pretty straightforward question, which was if you warm the atmosphere by a degree and a half or two degrees, does that substantially impact the vegetation in the Four Corners region? We'll come back to that. So if we want to think about how temperature increases impacts an uh, area like the Four Corners. Jeff, can you, how do you do the pointer on this one? Uh, I have to tap it to start. All right. Sorry, I just, I need that for this one. So, so if we think about an uh, area like the Four Corners region of the Southwest, we get snowpack that tends to peak kind of in the early spring, right? And then we get some monsoonal precipitation, and the vegetation tends to green up between the spring and the summer. And this kind of vegetation increase is indicative of, of most of the places on the planet that have kind of a monsoonal uh, greening, where you also see increases in air temperatures and saturation vapor pressures at about the same time. So this is planet A, the way things should happen, and what we may be seeing in planet, sorry, planet, this is, planet A is the world with climate change. So if we go to planet A with climate change, we may be seeing earlier snow melt, right, as temperatures increase, which can lead to decreased vegetation later in the season. And we know that we're gonna be seeing increased saturation vapor pressures, that's just basic physics. And we think that that could be related to more rapid vegetation drying. So in our study, we looked at these impacts in the Four Corners region, uh, shown here. And uh, we looked at the water year precipitation, shown on the x-axis here, and the temperature shown there uh, on the y-axis. And the 2018 October to September water year was exceptionally dry, the driest on record, but it was also exceptionally, uh, in terms of precipitation, but it was also exceptionally warm. So we only looked at the impacts of the temperature. We didn't look at the impacts of uh, potential climate change on precipitation. And we did this with a kind of classic planet A, planet B framework, where we start with planet A, where we took the observed weather and used that to drive a hydrologic model to estimate snowpack. Then we used a statistical model to estimate vegetation increase between the spring and the summer. Then we designed a planet B where we cooled the weather with an estimate or several estimates of human-induced warming and we ran our hydrologic simulations and our regression models to produce estimates of snowpack and vegetation in a world uh, without human-induced warming. And uh, basically what we found in this report, uh, led by Emily Williams from UC Santa Barbara, myself, Shrad Shukla, 
and Dan McAvoy was that the temperature increases substantially uh, reduced the snow melt later in the season by causing it to melt sooner. Uh, it substantially increased the water holding capacity of the atmosphere by about 12%, which had a substantially bigger impact on the vegetation, causing it to dry out substantially earlier and reducing August vegetation levels by about 18 to 30%, uh, substantially enhancing the impacts on a $3 billion drought in the southwestern United States. Hi, uh, I'm Walt Meyer. Uh, I'm at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Uh, we're a center within the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'm going to talk to you uh, about a paper uh, that, that we just published on basically a winter without sea ice in the Bering Sea. Uh, and that was the 2017 and 2018 winter. And then we repeated it again. Uh, this past year in, in largely the same way. And this was an event that we found was nearly impossible without uh, considering uh, climate change. And uh, the study was led by Rick Toman at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And starting out, I'll just show you an example of, of the ice conditions. The, on the left, it's 2013. This is a fairly typical Bering Sea ice cover on April 1st, which is right about when it reaches its maximum extent, covers most of the Bering Sea, extends well south of the Bering Strait. And then look at 2018 and 2019 on April 1st, and you see basically ice free other than in the far north or along the coast. Um, so vastly lower ice conditions compared to what we normally would expect. And this is a daily time series, a day by day of the extent of coverage, extent of aerial coverage. You can see it starts out, the season in the bearing for sea ice starts out beginning of October. It starts slowly and then ramps up quite quickly on average in November through December. The black line is our 1981 to 2010 median. And then in the light gray, that gives the range uh, at the top of the highest and at the bottom the lowest of any extent in our record before the 2017-2018 season. Um, so the lowest since 1979. And the blue line is our 2017-2018 that we studied in the paper uh, specifically. And you can see it's basically low throughout. Uh, it, it does rise some in January into early February, but through almost the entire season, it's lower than at any time on a given day that we had seen in our satellite record before. 2019 in green started out a little bit slow, but um, for the early part of the winter was largely normal, um, a little bit low, but nothing particularly extreme. Uh, it, looked, it was looking like, well, 2018, 2019 is going to be uh, kind of a boring year. It's not going to be like last year. Uh, and then we got to the end of January, and you can see it just drops uh, almost like a rock. Uh, for about six weeks, we were losing ice cover in the Bering Sea when we are normally ramping up towards our maximum. Uh, so a really extreme uh, ice loss in the middle of winter in 2019, and it dropped all the way into March below even 2018 levels for a period, and then remained low, again, lower than anything before 2017 that we had seen. And normally, our maximum is about 800,000 square kilometers. That's about the size of the state of Texas. But on April 1st, and for a lot of the winter, we were much lower, and we were about the size of the state of Illinois. Um, and uh, so for folks that uh, I've driven across the, the length of Illinois, it, it's pretty long, but it's not even near as long as uh, trying to go across Texas um, for anyone that's driven across Texas. Um, so then we looked at you know what, what are the chances of this happening without human impacts, uh, without climate change. Uh, so we did a, a pre-industrial run. This is essentially the Planet B run, where we run w where there isn't any human influence. We did uh, 1,800 years in the community Earth system model, the large ensemble project. Uh, we used the results from that. And so the, the 
thin black lines there are the, the 1800 years of, of model runs. And so this is essentially giving us the range of variation that would expect without climate change. And out of those 1800 years, only two, those yellow diamonds there, were below uh, our 2018 observations. And those we adjusted upward a bit to match the model, to be consistent, to make sure we were fairly comparing the models and the observations. And uh, with that, you can see only two out of 1800. And that gives us a fractional uh, of uh, attributable risk of 0.99. So essentially, nearly impossible for this to have happened uh, without, um, without climate change. And again, we had a repeat of this uh, the following year. And we haven't specifically assessed that, but nowhere in the 1800 year record do we see two years as low as we've seen uh, together uh, in the, in the, in the uh, large ensemble run. Looking forward uh, and backwards a little, we looked at the, the probability of this happening in the, in the model uh, in the 1950 climate. This is with the human influence, with the, with the uh, changes in, in uh, greenhouse gas. And you can see until 2000, really it was almost impossible to have this happening. Um, and then it's starting to increase. These decades are the end year of the decade. So we're now in the 2011 to 2020 decade. And you can see now, you, you can probably see that bar is now visible. But by looking forward, by 2050, 2050 uh, 2018 will be the median. Basically about half the years in that decade will be above 2018 and about half the years will be below it. Um, and so that will become basically the normal, the new normal uh, 2018 instead of an extreme low. By the decade ending in 2080, 2018 is going to be an extreme again, uh, but it's going to be an extreme high. Um, very few years will be higher than 2018. Most years, 94% will be lower than 2018. So within about 60 years, we'll go from an extreme low event that I'm talking about today to in 2080, if we have another press conference, um, we'll be talking about uh, 2018 extent being extremely high. I don't think I'll be here for that. Um, but somebody may be presenting on that is an unusually high year. The impacts uh, were quite noticeable in the Bering Sea among the indigenous peoples living there and, and others uh, operating in, in the Bering Sea. There was coastal flooding, for example, on Little Diomede Island. There was uh, major seabird die-offs, and we saw that again this year in 2019, and as well as uh, changes in the fish populations. Todd and ha Pollock moved much farther north. Uh, as the ice extent moved farther north. And we also saw um, uh, the Kuskokwim sled dog race in 2018, and maybe more familiar to folks, the Iditarod this past March in 2019 had to be rerouted because of either unsafe ice or lack of ice uh, altogether. So these had major impacts uh, in the uh, Alaska region. And so the Bering Sea, uh, sea ice was, uh, I think, a, a very good example of extreme, uh, an extreme event uh, that we published on in 2018 and happened again in 2019. And I'll just list again, Rick Toman was the lead author of the study and uh, my fellow co-authors. So thank you. All right, so now we'll open it up to questions from reporters in the room. Do we have any questions? Bud, Bud Ward with Yale Climate Connections. It, it seems for many decades, public awareness of this issue was, for lack of a better term, um, apathetic. It seems that the increased severity and frequency of severe storms, as you've documented here, has led to, if you will, a new normal. The social sciences are suggesting that um, apathy and fear uh, apathy is beginning to become fear and desperation, and that those are just as likely to lead to inaction as the apathy did for so long. So how do you achieve that balance between apathy, whether justified or not, and fear or despair, again, whether, whether uh, legitimate or not? I know Chris probably has an answer to this too. I I I, I would just uh, say that. Uh, oh, do I have to hit a button? Sorry. 
It's okay? It's on. Um, of course, this is a very complicated question. There are a lot of factors involved in the inaction, but um, keep in mind that one of the purposes of the report here is to put some actual quantification on the human influence and to get a real sense of what's happening uh, so that it's not just um, speculation, exaggeration, uh, or uh, undervaluing the human impact. All of these things happen in the media and they happen in public discourse. It's very hard to get a handle on these things. Uh, you know, a, a three-day uh, temperature extreme or uh, a, a particular flood that killed 200 people in Japan uh, in 2018, all these kinds of things are in the report. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the media and a lot of discussion on social media, et cetera. So in order to combat this um, sense of, of inability to take action over such overwhelming events, I think it's really important to have a clear idea of what was at play. And that's what this issue does. It, it gives a quantification that people who make decisions, who can influence opinions, can actually sort of take directed action and weigh the costs and benefits without information. I take tornadoes, for example. For many years, people had no idea how strong the winds were in tornadoes. They thought they were 500 uh, miles per hour. Some people thought they exceeded the uh, speed of sound. Uh, in the 50s, you, you saw all sorts of wild estimates about them. And then in the 60s and 70s, we got a real good handle on the, the wind speeds in tornadoes. And of course, now with r uh, mobile radar, even better. So with that information, no longer are tornadoes so much the subject of fear as of fascination and s directed study and actually uh, concrete steps in building codes and other, other things. So instead of uh, stoking fear, I think having real information, real quantifiable information like this puts that human uh, fingerprint in, in, a, uh, in terms that we can actually act without uh, just getting overwhelmed. So I'm sorry, Chris, you, you deal with this a lot. Yeah, so. I think I can pick, that's a great kind of kind of entree. So, um, you know, not really speaking to the idea of, of mitigating getting greenhouse gas emissions, but thinking about how we can constructively utilize the fear engendered in these kinds of report, which is a healthy, <laughs> I think, response. I mean, I live in Santa Barbara. We just had the cave fire that started about two miles from my house. And, you know, I know that the fire community was, primed and ready for that fire because they were watching the drop in the vegetation dryness and they knew that there was going to be a good chance for a wind event and they responded extremely well to that event and you know uh, I work closely with my partners at NOAA doing humanitarian relief efforts in Africa and you know a lot of the kind of studies that have been presented in these reports have already helped you know motivate improvements in our early warning systems. Um, there was a 2015 study about heat waves in India. India now has better forecasts for extreme heat waves. Um, the U.S. is developing better hurricane forecasting systems. You know, the, so there's a direct link between these attribution studies and uh, opportunity to make better early warning systems that is already happening. Horst Rademacher, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany. Uh, just a question about the Planet B models. So can you go a little bit more into details? Uh, is it just without any rise in CO2? What makes them different from uh, other climate models that are used to predict the future? Um, wh where is the difference between the models? Um, yeah. I mean, basically, th it's the same models. I mean, the same physics and everything. What, what the difference is, is we're running it with a two, an 1850 atmosphere. So they're, the, the CO2 levels and everything is, is at that. So it's before the emissions increase. So it's taking, you know, it, it's using uh, regular atmosphere. There's variability in the atmosphere. You know, there's hurricanes. There's, you know, things are happening there. But there's not the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. And yeah. land cover, yeah. Yeah, land cover is another thing that is also, yeah, the industrial. Right, in order, in order to uh, adjust, uh, to start the model off, you might not, not just uh, take out the greenhouse gases, but then fix, say, the sea ice conditions so that they don't act as if the, the gases are there, things like that, just to make sure that you get a pretty good comparison. Is that fair to say? Yeah.
Hi, uh, Mary Mel uh, from the Exploratorium. Stephanie, um, you mentioned uh, extreme events that um, wouldn't have been uh, possible under um, Planet B scenario. Can you step us through the attribution for the ocean heat wave, um, the blob? Because I understand it was pretty complex with a ridge and you know lack of wind um, shutting down, uh, upwelling, leading to the warming of the surface. Yeah. So, well, were you on that paper? No, you weren't. Okay, well, I can't remember. <laughs> So that paper came out in 2016. <laughs> so I'm gonna try and, um, so it might be better if we, if you give me a, a moment afterwards to look actually at the paper more closely. Um, but I can say that in terms of the, the overall um, approach that a lot of these papers are taking, it's um, when we, when they're looking for that role of climate change versus not having climate change, like you said, there's it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, what was the temperature, you know, in planet B versus planet A? That a lot of these papers, I think it's an interesting point that you brought up, which is that a lot of these papers are looking at multiple variables. So everything from blocking patterns potentially to you know sea surface temperature. Um, you know, uh, Chris's papers generally have this approach as well, where they're looking at you know, all these different types of variables that might actually go into an event, and understanding. And, and many of those are being driven, of course, by the climate models. But they're also, for instance, you know, when we look at things like wildfires or even the the drought paper that Chris put in, they're also cu coupling that with other models for things like vegetation. Um, most of the fire-related papers, for example, do that as well. So I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards, since it was a paper from a couple years ago. I don't want to misquote them. <laughs> Thanks. I would say that's that's one of the, the things that I, I, I'm really impressed with with these studies, is that eight years ago, it was more common to see a paper that just looked at one factor. It was, they, weren't, they weren't naive, but that was what they were focusing on. Mm -hmm. And now I would say more and more commonly you see multiple tests, looking at multiple factors, sometimes compound events that are sort of two different uh, ways of looking at the event in the same paper. These are very short papers. These are all aimed at uh, uh, people who apply the information. These are not papers that are super long. And you know, this is, this, is, this is a set of papers that's supposed to demonstrate what can be done in the field. And I'm, I'm just amazed at how much more they can pack into the papers and look at events from different perspectives now. And in the case of wildfires, for instance, the Australian wildfire paper we have, in this uh, issue is a classic example that they're looking at uh, the, the air pressure um, far from the fires. They're, they're trying to figure out, well, okay, but in order to make these fires particularly damaging in this particular area of Queensland, they had to come from a certain direction, you know, and therefore, how does that relate to the, 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 the synoptic, so to speak, the, the airflow patterns? But they're also talking about uh, connections to sea surface temperatures elsewhere just to double check to see if that had anything to do with it. There are a number of factors that go into wildfires, but that's true with Chris's paper on drought as well. And, and also these papers go a little step further. If you read them, you see that they're not only looking at multiple impacts there and trying to aggregate that into in clever ways, such as Chris uh, has done, because it's a, it's a drought that affects uh, you know, the ecology of the area and, the, and the, the plants and the animals that are, are, are you know, important to the economy there. Um, they, but they're, they're finding ways not only to aggregate, but then to separate out. Uh, the different things that they need to look at. And they'll, they'll suggest at the end of the paper that, hey, if only we had, you know, a little bit better information on how soil moisture feeds back into the atmosphere, uh, we could have done an even better job. And I'm going to bet that in two or three years we're going to see that. Uh, and that's why I think this is really an indicator of where the science is going, not just where it is now. And 21 papers of that, that's quite an array of, of different uh, um, uh, thoughts on where the science is going to be. Hi, uh, Carolyn Gramling with Science News Magazine. Um, I wanted to ask about real-time climate attribution studies. And um, one thing I'm wondering is I know there's a lag time between what appears in the BAMS report. It's obviously last year's um, events. Is there any kind of overlap that you're seeing in terms of like those real-time studies eventually popping up in the BAMS report? And also, you know, are they all part of the same ecosystem of understanding climate attribution? How do you, how do you view those, the real-time studies? I, I know there are two papers in here that explicitly say there was real-time attribution of this, which is great. It's very important to do that, too. It's another way to drive the science forward. But we're taking another look at it in this 
uh, we've got, got a little more time, let's look at it in more sophisticated ways. Let's figure out why are the real-time attributions disagreeing with each other? Are they really disagreeing? And, and in one case, uh, the paper here resolves th those so supposed disagreements by showing that the, the way the event is classified matters a great deal to what the result you get is. And uh, in another one, they basically redo and, and, and refine a particular study that was a real event, uh, real time attribution. So there's a lot of value to taking a step back and doing it a little bit differently because the way you ask the question <coughs> really affects the answer you get a lot of the time. Yeah, I can just say for this particular report, um, we have always uh, maintained a, the, the highest standard for the peer review process. These papers actually go, undergo two rounds of peer review and we appreciate and recognize that there is a real-time attribution effort ongoing, but like Jeff said, there is um, always value in taking a step back with more time and going through a, a process that, that the traditional peer review offers that I think that um, in particular for non-heat events, uh, is, is still essential. Um, so with heat events, uh, and you'll see the more of this, I think that in the, in the European, there's a couple different European organizations that are doing more with real time, um, but in particular heat attribution coming out of, you know, for example, the UK Met Office and others. But, uh, and I think that's in part because the, the heat methodology, simply looking at was this warmth attributable to climate change, and if so, by how much, is very well established. The literature behind it is incredibly robust. It's almost like you know Noah's um, process for putting out a seasonal prediction is an incredibly well-defined, peer-reviewed process, and then they turn the crank on that, and so they don't necessarily peer-review every single seasonal prediction. So in some ways, heat um, is, is moving into that realm, but for the other event types, especially with the level of complexity that's being included in them to really understand, especially this when there's um, you know a lot of synoptic variables that are driving these events, uh, I, I personally, and I think my hopefully my editors agree with me that there's still a real value with, to having a, a very robust and intensive peer review process. Um, as part of that, I will say that not all, I don't think we've ever had a year where every single paper has actually made it through the peer review process. It's very, it's very rigorous um, and it is you know, designed to ensure that the methodologies um, are being applied and, and that the, the way that they're looking at the event really meets the standards of using the best practices that are that are available and out there. Yeah, th this issue really is a fine balance between uh, uh, showing what can be done at, you know, and showing things that are a little bit ex uh, new and interesting to, to see what can be done, the testing the boundaries, and that ends up filtering down into the into the uh, real time attribution uh, techniques that are acceptable. The peer review process really does filter out quite a bit from this issue. There are a lot of really good people who are doing really good work. But we're looking very specifically at that, what's, what's sort of on the cusp, but still um, uh, possible in concise papers that, that are basically uh, geared at an applications community as well. It's not just insiders in the field. So the peer reviewers have done a tremendous uh, job of, of, of elevating a lot of these papers or saying, look, uh, th this, this should go in a bigger paper somewhere else where you take a little more time with it. Uh, and that happened quite frequently this year. And I would also say Stephanie and Andy and, and those who are involved in filtering and sort of trying to figure out which papers do the job we're looking for, trying to demonstrate the state of the art, um, they are also filtering quite a bit and guiding these papers so that they're, they're not just saying what's obvious about what can be done. We're, we're demonstrating techniques here, uh, not, not just uh, taking advantage of the fact that there are all these extremes now to talk about. I think we're actually out of time. Do we have any questions on the chat? Okay, good, then we'll end, but the speakers, if you wanna stick around for those a couple other questions, I think that were hanging around, but this will officially conclude now and we'll uh, reconvene at 1.30. Thank you all for your questions and being here.